Did John find you? Oh, John was hoping you could log in again. Oh, yeah. Mic check, one, two, three, check, check, testing, one, two, three, check, testing, this is closer, check, one, two, one, two, three, Carissa ate an omelet this morning, on a scale of one to five, how good was it? Check, one, two, is that good, John? Should I keep going? Check, one, two, three, four, five, astronomy update. Getting our levels for stream and house. <laughs> we good? Or keep going? Okay.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Glippa. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our astronomy update lecture this year. Dr. Shannon Schmoll is the director of the Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State University. Dr. Schmoll has a joint PhD in astronomy and astrophysics and education. Shannon serves, serves as a treasurer of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association and as the chair of the IPS Education Committee. She also sits on the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee and is currently running for IPS president. She is a wonderful mother, friend, boss, and leader, and is here to give us our astronomy update for 2022. Let's welcome Dr. Shannon Schmoll. Hi, I'm, I'm gonna be walking. Good morning, everyone. Are you ready to be updated? All right, so uh, I'll probably be wandering around because I can't actually see the screens right now. Uh, but for our, our new friends here at Glippa, uh, just a little bit about Astronomy Update. This has been going on since when? Ever? Ever? Yeah. <laughs> forever. Uh, Jim Kaler started it, and then Ron Kachuk uh, took it over, and about four years ago, I was asked to take over. And so this is my fourth update. Woo! <laughs> and it's a general review of some of the stories in astronomy of the past year. I always start with a more general, broad speed run of the cool stuff that you don't really need me to tell you more information on, because you can go read NASA and all their great stuff and all the news stories, but then I'll go in depth on a few more stories after that. So with that, let's get started. So hold on. I have to log in again. Do you see that? Okay. Do you see it? Okay. See that? Okay, so this is like the super quick review of all the really fun things of the past year. Uh, in the upper left corner there, we have all five planets in the morning sky happen this summer. Who went out and took pictures? That's my picture. I took that. I'm so proud of me. <laughs> um, and not only that, they were in order. So uh, what I really like about this picture is uh, you see the sunrise coming up. I don't think you can see Mercury in it yet. Uh, we, I think we're using binoculars at that point. And then we have Venus. And then what comes after Venus? Earth. <laughs> and you have the moon there, which is part of the Earth-Moon system. So the Earth is represented there with the moon. And then we have Mars, and then Jupiter, and then Saturn sort of off camera there. So we had them in order, which was really cool and special. And uh, I got up super early to go see this. And I got other people to get up super early with me. So it was great. Uh, on the bottom left corner, uh, or yeah, left. I don't know. It's my right. I can't tell anymore. Anyway. Black holes, we got a picture of the Sagittarius A star black hole in the center of our galaxy. So back when we had M87 in that first image of the black hole that we're really excited about, there were two candidates. There was M87 and Sagittarius A star as the two that we would be able to get pictures of. They started with M87 because it was a little bit easier to get, but now we have Sagittarius A star, so yay! That black hole is why I love black holes. I got so into that black hole in, in my freshman year of college. Um, up in the mid, uh, middle there, on the top there, th that's a data release from LIGO from late 2019, early 2020 that came out this year. And what it shows is a bunch of stuff that we're finding with LIGO with gravitational waves, but we've really moved into this realm of routine with LIGO. So something that was super cool super exciting is now something that's really routine and that we still get to use. And I think that's important to know that when we get these discoveries and we keep on doing it, it was really new and exciting. And it's going to continue being important as we continue to get more and more data. So just keep that in mind that it's still going and we're still getting great stuff. 
bottom middle, that is uh, the wreckage of Perseverance's landing um, when it went down onto Mars, taken with Ingenuity. So that is really cool that we, you know, Ingenuity last year, that was the news. But the fact that we've got this cool up-close picture of something is really nice. All right, we're going to briefly move into the sad realm. Um, in the upper right corner there, we have uh, the fire at Kitt Peak. So Kitt Peak National Observatory had a fire this year. Luckily, the telescopes came out okay. They did lose three buildings, inclu including some of the dormitories that uh, scientists use when they go up there. Uh, but it did end up, uh, the telescopes ended up being okay. It was a little touch and go there. And in the bottom right, that's Eugene Parker. Uh, he is a He was a solar uh, physicist and plasma physicist. The Parker Solar Probe is named after him. He passed away at the age of 94 this year. But I want to bring him up because he has connections to the Great Lakes. He grew up in Houghton, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. He did his undergrad at, the, at Michigan State University. Go green. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Go green. Thank you, MSU people. <laughs> um, but he he left the region um, uh, for grad school, but came back, and most of his career was in Chicago. So his his career and life very much span the Great Lakes region. Uh, so I wanted to make sure we talk about him. All right. Next. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to not swear right now. <laughs> We all know what's going on in Ukraine. We all know that Putin has started an unjust war in Ukraine. And there's a lot of sad news, and it is affecting every reach of our society right now, and that includes space. So even before the war, Putin decided to go blow up one of his defunct satellites to test an anti-missile rocket, which left more space junk in an already polluted orbital space around Earth. And then on top of that, uh, as of the last, the latest I've heard on the ISS is that Russia is pulling out by 2024. So that cooperation, it, ISS is going to be decommissioned soon anyway, but even then they're pulling out much sooner than planned. And then also Europe ended their cooperation with Russia on ExoMars 2020 rover. So this is also spreading through space. So F that guy. All right, let's let's go have some fun. This happened. Yay! Yay! Uh, it was a Christmas miracle, right? Uh, finally launched on December 25th, so Christmas Day of last year. Uh, we we've all made this joke, right, that it was a Christmas miracle. Update last year, we had a launch date. It got pushed back a couple times, but it happened. And it was exciting, and it went out to its cool spot behind Earth, and it unfolded, and it was beautiful, and it was calibrated, and then we got to open the presents. <laughs> and I have updated this slide so many times <laughs> because we are like the first grandchild on Christmas morning <laughs> opening all of these things. That's not even all of them. I fixed this this morning, because <laughs> I added in eh, the pillars, the pillars. There we go. But we are getting all of these beautiful images that is absolutely amazing. And this thing is going to be amazing for us as educators to inspire the next generation and the current generation and all the generations for a long time, just like Hubble did. And the stocking stuffers. These are some of my favorite memes that came out. I think my, my two favorite are the middle ones. So you've got the horse head from Hubble and then the horse head from James Webb. And then the four and a half billion light years away with the ultra deep field and then a security camera. So <laughs> you would think we can do better. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of hilarity to be had. But also like every Christmas, we, this is why we can't have nice things, right? There was a micrometeorite impact on, uh, on JWST. Actually, it's had a few at this point. Most of them have been fairly negligible in how it's affecting the images. But one segment you can see down there on the bottom right is, um, was damaged quite a bit more. But since it's one segment, it's, oh, it's not so bad on the images, clearly. 
from pillars. Um, but we do have, um, it is something that we need to be aware of and we do need to consider this for future missions on where exactly is a safe place to put the telescopes. But so far it's, it's still holding up okay. Okay, this happened. So the DART mission, which was really cool because we got the, the impact live. We got to watch it as it approached and then crashed in to uh, the smaller of the two to try to change its orbit. And this was a test to make sure that we can change orbits of potentially hazardous objects that are coming towards Earth. And it did a pretty good job. They were hoping for about a 70 second orbital period change. They ended up with 32 minutes. So, woo, go NASA! So what this also shows us is that we basically need to take the approach of an annoying cat trying to get your attention by trying to knock something off the table when it comes to these, and not Armageddon. Don't blow things up. Also, this is happening, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that picture. <laughs> so Artemis one, which is taking humans back to the moon and will also land the first woman and person of color on the moon, uh, was supposed to have its first launch in late August. It got delayed because ultimately a faulty sensor. And then it was rescheduled and then it was scrubbed again because of a hydrogen link. And then it got scheduled again and it got scrubbed again because of a hurricane. And now we have a launch date again in November, so fingers crossed. Everyone cross your fingers right now, and your toes, and your eyes. So I don't have to keep rescheduling events in my dome. Okay, so hopefully this will be on update next year. Okay, so, and now for tonight's top story. <laughs> I'm glad there's some laughs. laughs. All right, and so for anyone who's not familiar, there's a show called Last Week Tonight about the news with John Oliver. So this is last year this morning with Shannon Schmoll. Um, and um, also, this is how much I love you. I went and I found out what font they use, and I use the exact font. <laughs> and I really like this font. Okay. So before we go into the top stories, uh, as some people have seen my pictures, I start with a stack of articles that's like this big. Like, it's big. And then I have to try to windle it down to a 45 minute talk. Um, so poor our printer at Abrams Planetarium. I'm sorry, Shane. He's the one who's always like, what are you printing? Um, so my theme, I go, I try to find a theme and I try to use that to dwindle down things. So this year's theme is everything old is new again uh, because we have JWST. So all of our really cool pictures from Hubble are brand new again. And we have Artemis. We're taking people back to the moon again and it's gonna be new and exciting. So I'm trying to carry that through through some of the stories. I'll be honest, some of them are a bit of a stretch. But that's okay. So first story. We're not over this guy. <laughs> so Beetlejuice dimmed back in 2019. We were really excited about it. And we're like, what's going on? And this was a whole update segment a couple years ago on trying to explain what's going on. But we keep trying to understand a little bit more. And so this story is one that I thought was really interesting because it wasn't actually that much about Beetlejuice. It was about testing a new idea using Beetlejuice. But a quick review. Uh, back a couple years ago when this was happening and everyone was trying to figure out what was going on, the first idea was uh, maybe the effective temperature which would affect the brightness uh, went down. And it did a little bit, but not enough to explain what was going on. Another idea was that there were some star spots, so which made a big chunk of Betelgeuse uh, dimmer uh, overall. And so the overall effect brought it down. Um, or the other idea, which seems to be generally accepted at this point, is that it coughed up a big old chunk of dust and then that cooled and blocked a lot of the light. And this is like what's on view space all the time right now. Okay, but this is what's really cool. So this team uh, decided to test out an idea with this Himawari meteorological satellite. So this is something that takes pictures of Earth every, sing every 10 minutes, so a lot of pictures of Earth. But if you look, over here, okay, and then now you guys, 
this like tiny little rim around the earth there captures a little bit of the background sky. And so Beetlejuice photobombs <laughs> like that horse. And he's like, hey, look at me. And so they're like, OK, we'll look at you. And they realize that you see Beetlejuice about every 1.7 days or so in this data, which means we now have really high time resolution of Beetlejuice during this time of the dimming. So it's not just the, the other data that we had that was a lot more spaced out. We have information and spectra on Beetlejuice every two days, basically. So they decided to look at that just to see, like, do we see anything new? Do we, is there anything else going on? Uh, and so you have, this is the, the magnitude of Beetlejuice right here. So this is the great dimming. And I do sound effects. OK. <laughs> OK, great dimming. OK, you get it too. All right, and then we have the radius of Betelgeuse, which you can estimate. And you can see that it, it, was, it was pulsing, which is something that it does. We know that. Uh, and then you have the effective temperature, which also went down on the bottom left there. And so again, effective temperature went down, but not enough to explain the amount of dimming we saw. And they also looked at the uh, extinction and optical depth, which corresponds to how much is the light being blocked. And that went up quite a bit. Um, but what they also noticed was that you could see water Water. So that's the far right one there. And they saw an interesting transition of it going from emission to absorption um, right before the dimming event. So they're saying that this is consistent with what we already knew, which is that there's some sort of big cloud that got burped up from, uh, from Betelgeuse. It cooled, so that's why you're seeing some water. And then it eventually got subsumed back into Betelgeuse. And so they call it an episodic bursty event which makes me think of a toddler <laughs> having a tantrum. So their data shows us that it's consistent with what we already saw, but now we have this really high resolution time data. And now this is a new way that we can uh, get information on stars serendipitously from this other satellite, which is always fun kind of data. And it's also fun to say serendipitously. So there we go. So next up. There's a new type of nova. It's a micronova. It's like this times 10 to the negative 6. All right, so this, one, this one's fun. So let's do a review of novas. There we go. So there's different types of novas. There's a classical nova. So this is, you have a white dwarf that has another companion star going around it. And it siphons off material from the companion star, forms a disk around it, and then the material from the disk falls onto the surface of the white dwarf. Eventually, it gets to the right pressure and temperature that the hydrogen ignites. And you have runaway uh, thermonuclear runaway events. And then, it, so you have this big burst of energy, and then it fades over time. A recurrent nova is the same thing, but it keeps happening. And then a dwarf nova is related and similar, except that instead of getting all the material onto the surface of the star, it's happening in the disk. So, uh, so it doesn't have as much energy as a, as a classical nova. And then a type 1 x-ray burst is like the recurrent nova. So there's Groundhog Day. It's Groundhog Day and x-ray. It's like that, but it's happening with a neutron star, and the energy release is much higher. Um, and it's in the x-rays, hence x-ray burst. Then, of course, there's supernovas. Come on, guys. <laughs> hilarious. This is what we excel at. OK. So no, <laughs> that's not supernova. <laughs> so this is the new one. So this was using uh, test data. Um, which is looking uh, for other planets and stuff. Uh, but it was looking at the star TV Columbae. And it saw this thing where it had three bursts really rapidly, one right, right after another. It went boom, boom, boom. Uh, and so this is some of the information on it. But the, the main thing is that you had these really rapid jumps in energy that faded off fairly quickly. And uh, um, Three days between each one, you had them before and after there wasn't much going on. So that was interesting. 
And the amount of energy was um, also a lot less in the end. So you can see the total energy across all three bursts was about 10 to the 38 ergs. The next one, they also found something similar, but with just two bursts uh, in, um, in Ursa Major. There is another star there. And so similar thing, same kind of profile in terms of the burst, rose really fast, faded pretty quickly. Each lasted um, not very long at all, and about a total energy of 10 to the 38 ergs. And then there is another one, which is Assassin. Uh, <laughs> And so this is similar, except it was just one burst, but it was another similar amount of energy, just over 10 to the 39 ergs. So it's still in the same range. And uh, also jumped up, faded down, uh, and didn't last a super long time compared to the other ones. So what's going on? So a classical nova generally releases around 10 to the 45 ergs. This is 10 to the minus 6 less than that. See, micronovae. Um, and it was a much shorter duration, and so it was a little bit trickier to detect, but that's why they were able to use a, a survey telescope to do that. Um, and we know that classical nova are related to thermonuclear runaway, which is a really hard thing to say. Um, and so, okay, I'm sorry, McAfee. Um, I can't even see it on my screen. Okay, so they were trying to figure out what's going on. So they offered a few different ideas. One, is this a dwarf nova? Uh, no, dwarf novas are not, they don't release as much energy. They are, they are less energetic than what they're seeing. So it's probably not that. Then they were like something called magnetically gated flares that it, it, I don't fully understand what they are, honestly. Um, but it does involve a certain mass transfer rate, and they do happen a lot more regularly than what we're seeing. They don't go boom, 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 and then stop. It's more boom, boom, boom. See? Sound effects. Okay. So that was one idea. Another was enhanced ma mass transfer. So within the disk itself, there might be an instability that causes more mass to dump onto the star. But again, the uh, types of energies that you see with this is not what we're seeing here. Or the companion star had a huge flare of some kind, but again, the energies that typically are seen there is not what we see here. So none of these are likely. So what they think is going on, because the profile is very similar to thermonuclear runaway that we see in classical novae and type 1 x-ray bursts, is that instead, you, uh, if you have magnetic fields going on on your white dwarf, the material gets funneled onto the poles of the white dwarf instead. And you need a certain critical pressure across the whole star to have that thermonuclear runaway in a classical nova. And so you don't need as much material to reach that pressure if you're concentrating it on the poles. And so they think that that then ignites on just the poles, and that's why we get this type of nova. So there's also some motion that's pretty clear in the spectral lines when these happen. So they think that what's happening is it could just ignite all in one go, which is what we saw with Assassin, or it could ignite, uh, flow out, fall back down, reignite, and that's why you're getting these bursts um, in quick succession. So it's, it's an interesting new type of nova to add into our repertoire of cool things that explode. Deserts. Neptune deserts. OK. So this one, um, sorry, I'm really distracted by that little window. OK, so M dwarf stars are our most common type of star that forms. And so uh, we want to try to find planets around them. And we don't often find Neptune-sized planets, especially close to the star. So they call this a Neptune desert. Uh, and so. Uh, they're trying to find what they can find, and they found this, um, uh, sorry, the part of the reasons why they, they um, don't think that you can have many big planets next to or close to stars is because it gets hotter, it causes the material to evaporate, you don't really have a lot of stuff there. And so it is interesting when we do find one so that we can try to uh, constrain parameters around planet formation. 
So they took data from Tess, Spitzer, Elsass, Las Cumbres, Trappist South, La Silla, and Gemini. They took a lot of data on this thing. Um, and they, they took images and they took photometry. So these are the light curves from all the different telescopes of this particular planet. And you can use the shapes of these light curves and model them in order to try to understand the size and the mass and the radius um, of the planet and the orbital period. And it has a pretty short orbital period around this star. And then they modeled the data, one assuming a circular orbit and one assuming a non-circular orbit. And the, data, the models pretty much agreed, um, except for how eccentric the orbit is. And even then, it's a pretty minor eccentricity. So it does seem to be a relatively, uh, it's one of the least dense and largest uh, Neptune-like planets. It's a super Neptune around an M dwarf star that's ever been found in this uh, dwarf uh, Okay, the, the, the dwarf um, around an M dwarf. So this is going to help us constrain information on exoplanets. But what I think was one of the more interesting bits is that they did find water vapor in the atmosphere of this one. And that's what was really in all the news stories. And so when a planet goes in front of its host star, you have the spectra from the star, and then it can filter through the atmosphere of the planet. And so you can see what the planet's atmosphere is made out of once you take out the star's atmosphere. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, so it is a Neptune oasis. Thank you. That wasn't my joke. That was actually one of the researchers' jokes in the news article. So. But it's a good one, so I used it. OK, so what's nice about this one, this is going to tie back into JWST, is that this is exactly what JWST is going to excel at, is measuring the atmospheres of planets as they go around their host stars. So this is actually a sample uh, spectra. They, they simulated what a spectra might look like if we were to look at it with JWST. And the hope is now this is a really good candidate for JWST to go look at this. And so uh, hopefully they will, and we'll be able to confirm and get a little more constraints on that uh, for this particular planet, which has the great name of TOI-674b. Okay. All right, moving on. Who knows about the Large Magellanic Cloud? Yay! So that is a dwarf galaxy that orbits our own. And we have quite a few dwarf galaxies. And most galaxies have dwarf galaxies. Now. Let's back up and talk about big galaxies real quick. I said, no, now you went too far. OK, so there's these ideas of hierarchical galaxy merger. So we end up with seed galaxies that merge with one another to get bigger galaxies that we see today. So this is one idea. And this is uh, something that has been in all of the textbooks for a long time. But in another version of Turtles all the way down, um, it is also believed that the dwarf galaxies that orbit around the bigger ones would also go through merger events. And we see that evidence within the Milky Way and our dwarf galaxies quite well. There's the, the Magellanic Stream that shows interaction between the clouds and the Milky Way. There's also evidence of interaction between the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, but they still remain distinct objects. They haven't fully merged into one thing. And so, but the expectation is that they could. So taking the two brightest dwarf galaxies near, nearest to us, let's go see if we can find evidence of a past merger. Now, the thing is, Large Magellanic Cloud, which is our satellite galaxy, has its own satellites. Again, turtles all the way down. And I put the tiniest turtle I possibly could on that top. That is the same turtle. It is not a green dot, just so you know. I have some fun with this. <laughs> um, so the dwarf galaxies have their own dwarf galaxies. And the ones that go around the Large Magellanic Cloud tend to be these ultra-faint, dark matter-dominated dwarf galaxies. OK, so they wanted to go try to find evidence that there was merger. And the way that we look at mergers often is through kinematics. We look at how the stars are moving to show how they might have bumped into one another and settled into a, another galaxy. So they wanted to do something different using chemical tagging. So globular clusters, which also are very old and come along with all galaxies, even the dwarf galaxies have their own 
uh, their own globular clusters. And those globular clusters have fingerprints based on the ratios of different elements. So they looked at several different um, element ratios here, and they looked at all the globular clusters that around the Large Magellanic Cloud, and noticed that one of them, NGC 2005, uh, looked different. Um, compared to everything else. It was uh, uh, quite depleted in many of the elements compared to, to uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So that's what you're seeing sort of in the upper one is a comparison of Large Magellanic Cloud to NGC 2005. And then they also did a comparison of it with Milky Way galaxies, just to be sure, um, on the bottom right. So the red here uh, shows where uh, NGC 2005 is. And this is Milky Way in the gray and the green right here in the middle, that's all the LMC. So again, here's NGC 2005, the green is LMC, and then the gray is the Milky Way. So it is quite different from the others. So this suggests that um, this was a leftover globular cluster that was not subsumed into the Large Magellanic Cloud during a past merger. And so most of the globular clusters there are LMCs, but then there's this weird one, so most of that material probably ended up in the Large Magellanic Cloud as a merger. And also, they, they made sure that it wasn't uh, any calibration error, so they would go say like, all right, well, let's set our model to say that this abundance of this one is the same, and then it changed everything even more. So it, no matter how you do it, this one does look different. Uh, so this is uh, also, if you look at, uh, they modeled what sort of evolution history could have made this kind of abundance levels, and it was consistent with one that is an ultra-faint dark matter dominated uh, dwarf galaxy. So as we expect for the Large Magellanic Cloud. So that's cool. So there's also more mergers. It's happening on all the levels. OK. Ready? This one might be a little bit black hole dominated this year. I love black holes. OK. So we have found our first black hole with microlensing, according to all of the news stories. It's a little more complicated than that. But uh, let's go take a look. So. Large stars, when they die, end up as black holes. That's right. So in our galaxy, we expect to find around 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 isolated black holes left over from when st large stars die. We have found 24. So um, little discrepancy there. Um, and all of them have been in binary systems. So these are black holes that are orbiting with another star. So we're seeing the effects from the black hole on the companion star, not the black hole itself, or from the disk of material that ends up around the black hole being siphoned off from that companion star, similar to a dwarf nova or a, a nova. So we don't really have a, har a good way of constraining how many are actually out there to make sure that we're right. And so microlensing is one of those ways that we might be able to do that. So a microlensing event is when a, a, an object moves in front of a star, and then because of the gravitational effects on the light, it causes a star to brighten. So let's go take a look at that. So this is a, a, a diagram on the bottom. Uh, so if you have your compact object or your object, whatever is causing the microlensing to move in front of the background star, as it does that, the light gets bent around. And so normally in, in gravitational lensing, when all the images that we see with the beautiful stretched out galaxies and things like that, that's a much bigger version of it. So you follow the, this line backwards, it looks like you have another image of that star in this direction over here. So in uh, gravitational lensing, you end up with multiple images of the same thing because of this light bending effect. With microlensing, it's happening on such a small scale that you're not being able to resolve those images, and so it's more of a brightening effect instead of the same star. And so you get these sort of profiles of light, bloop, and then it falls back down. So 
there's thousands of microlensing events that are found every year, and the expectation of all of them is that about 1% of them would be caused by black holes. That's a needle in a haystack kind of situation. But if you take the ones that are longer, the events are much longer, uh, so the effects are starting sooner as your massive object comes closer, uh, you're going to have a better chance, closer to a 40% chance, of finding a black hole or a neutron star, a compact object, all right? So that's what this team did. They used the Ogle uh, experiment, which is a Polish experiment that's looking at microlensing and trying to find uh, microlensing events all the time. And they took a bunch of candidates. They found four that looked promising. And then after uh, doing some more analysis, one of them looked like it might be a black hole. Uh, so they took um, a bunch of information. So they took the light data, the photometry, as well as the motion data, the astrometry. Because everything's moving, there's going to be additional effects on how long an event can last because one thing's moving this way and one's moving that way and relative to one another. So they modeled that. Uh, and they did two different models depending, with two different ways of weighting the photometry data with the astrometry data. And so this is what they got depending on which model that they used. You have something between 2.15 to 3.8 solar masses. Um, then, uh, so it does seem to, and they looked at that region, they couldn't actually see a star, so it doesn't seem to be a star. So it seems to be a compact object. So this is anything that's pretty dense, so a neutron star or a black hole. So depending on which mass it actually is, it could be a neutron star, it could be a black hole. It's really hard to know for sure. Uh, but depending on which model you use, it's anywhere between a 44% chance to 100% chance it is a black hole. But either way, it's a compact object, and that's the first time we did this. On top of that, there was another paper that also did analysis that got that this, the mass of this was seven solar masses, which puts it squarely into the black hole region. Unsure which one it really is. They, they're Even in their paper, they're like, we don't know why we're different. So. This is going to take a little bit more uh, investigating, but either way, we're finding we found a compact object, which is hard to see otherwise, and that is really cool. And microlensing is cool. So yay. OK. All right. So active galactic nuclei, or AGN, are one of my favorite things in the whole universe. So these are really, really, uh, these are galaxies that have uh, supermassive black holes in their center. Most galaxies do. But these ones ha are feeding. Uh, the black hole is feeding quite a bit, so they're really, really bright. Uh, and so the, there's a lot of different types that we started finding. And so there's this unified model of AGN that has come out that's been taught in undergrad and grad classes for a really long time. So the idea is that you have either a radio loud version or a radio quiet, depending on if these radio jets are happening. Uh, and then the material uh, or what type you're seeing is based entirely on viewing angle after that. So if you're looking right down a radio jet, that's a blazar. Uh, and then uh, if you are looking right down this way, it's a radio quiet quasar. Uh, and then the viewing, you have these different clouds of material that can go around the black hole. If it's really close, it's moving a lot faster. So the blue and redshift effects from that will stretch out the spectral lines and widen them. So that's called the broadline region. And then you have the ones farther away that are not as stretched out. So that's your narrow line region. You also have this huge dusty torus around it. And then here's the disk of the black hole that uh, shines really bright, particularly in x-rays. And so a Seifert 2 galaxy in particular, you're looking at this angle, and the dusty torus is blocking the broadline region and the black hole itself. So a paper came out in 2020 using the gravity experiment, looking at M77, um, which also has an NGC name, which I'm blanking on right now. And they took their data and they were like, well, according to what how we're modeling this, this is this disk that we're seeing is much thinner than we expect. It's not a big, thick, dusty torus, and it seems to be pretty hot, actually. So this doesn't seem to fit with our AGN model at all for a galaxy that's been a 
kind of example of a CFERT to Galaxy for a really long time. We might need to rethink this unified model. And so everyone else was like, hold on. We've been using this for 30 years. Hold on. Um, so ultimately, though, what they were using with the gravity experiment was a much narrow, much narrow region of the wave band that, uh, that uh, it was a very narrow region of light that they were looking at. So another team came along using the Matisse instrument on the Very Large Telescope Interferometer and matched that with a bunch of radio data as well from places like ALMA, which is really high resolution. And we've gotten some really high resolution images across a much broader wavelength realm now of this particular galaxy. So this is what they look like. They did several different versions of image reduction to make sure that there weren't any artifacts that they were seeing in there. Uh, and it was pretty consistent across different types of wavelengths. Bands. So these are the images that they got. They noticed a few different, they took a spectra of several different regions in this image to try to understand what's going on and in the brightest region in particular, and then this one down here, they call this the southern extension, uh, they modeled the spectra that they were seeing and the, they tried it first with uh, just sort of regular interstellar dust models and it didn't fit very well at all but then they added in one with olivine and one with olivine and carbon and things matched a little bit better so to have this type of stuff in uh, the this region here suggests that it's a lot cooler you need cooler temperatures so it's not a really hot disk it seems to be cold dust uh, which you would expect from a torus or a cooler dust i should say so there was um so it does seem to be cooler. And then when you also take the radio images and overlay them on top, you can use where it's brightest in radio to try to pinpoint where the black hole might be. And it was really hard to see, but there's like a tiny little white dot around there and I'm really shaky. So I'm sorry. Hold on. I can't, I got it. I got to get closer. Hold on. <laughs> there. Yes, there's a cold front coming down. Do you feel it in your bones? The pressure is changing. Let's go make a cloud in a bottle. That's my favorite experiment. Here. That's where the black hole seems to be. So it is shrouded in this other material, like you would expect with a Seifert galaxy. The, if you model sort of a, a torus at an angle and what we'd actually be able to see, this matches. So this not only reaffirms that the AGN unified model is still valid uh, with this one, it's also the first time we've actually been able to image it this well to really show that. It's always just been based on spectra before. So this is exciting. Yay! So this is all new again. We are, we're reconfirming things. Okay. I think this is my last one. So quasars. Quasars are really bright, AGN. And as we heard in the talk last night, we keep finding galaxies much closer to the Big Bang than we expect. So they, there is some discussion about like a Z of 13, so really, really, really early in the universe. But we are also seeing uh, quasars, at a Z of seven, which is about 140 million years after the Big Bang, which is still sooner than we expect. And part of the reason why that's sooner is because you have to build up your galaxies and you have to build up your black holes. We don't start the universe, universe with a supermassive black hole. And every galaxy seems to have a supermassive black hole in its core that is directly proportional to the size of the galaxy. So they, they grow together. So black holes, galaxies, it's all part of understanding the evolution. So you have to have some time in order to actually build those up, either through mergers of black holes or through the accretion of that material, uh, really quick accretion of material into those black holes. And so when we see things at a really high redshift, or which corresponds to early universe, that's a bit sooner than we expected because it's like, did we actually have enough time to do that? So we need to start understanding exactly how these things happen and why we end up with them so early. So generally what we see with the closer quasars is you start off with a really um, high starburst galaxy that's really dusty and it's shrouding the quasar and it starts to uh, fade over time and material uh, settles down. You have an obscured quasar and then you end up with an unobscured quasar. And a redshift of seven, 
where we have found these uh, most distant quasars. Um, they, we've seen the really dust shrouded versions and we've seen the unobscured versions. We haven't found the transition point. So there was a candidate that came out uh, with the good survey from Hubble. So this is archival Hubble information. Hubble is still relevant and we still love Hubble, even though JWST came along. Okay. And it was really interesting and unique. So they confirmed that it was at a redshift of about seven uh, using this. Uh, this is a Lyman break galaxy. So there's a point um, with the Lyman lines uh, within a galaxy spectra where it sort of just you can't see it anymore. And depending on how redshifted that is, that can tell you how far away something is. So they confirmed that it's really far out there. They looked at it with different data. And it's very faint in x-ray. And when I say very faint, it's pretty much non-existent. We don't see it in x-ray, and we always see quasars in x-ray. So that's like, all right, what's going on? Um, and it's also rather bright and rich in ultraviolet light. So they're like, OK, is this, there we go. Is this perhaps just a really compact starburst region? Is this a galaxy that's just really, really um, producing a lot of stars right now, and that's why we're not really seeing x-rays. But when you look at that and you subtract any potential AGN out of the spectra that you're modeling, it's near its limit of what's physically possible for how fast you can form stars. When you add the AGN back in, it is now beyond that limit. So it cannot be explained by starburst alone. So the fact that we uh, do seem to have an uh, uh, an ultra, sorry, we do seem to have a X-ray faint AGN at this point suggests that this is probably a, an, a dust obscured transition quasar at the same redshift. So we seem to have found one of each kind at this redshift now. And then they all were also able to use that information to estimate the mass of the black hole, which is, I believe, around 10 to the 7 solar masses, which is consistent with other black holes in this region in terms of the how they're growing over time. So it does seem to be that we did indeed find this particular missing link in quasars. <sighs> The end. I went almost an oh no, it's on. Are there questions? Oh, yes. Um, so I've seen a sort of one that kind of looks like they quickly came up with the Mhm. Mm um, I have not encountered that, and maybe others here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the mic's back on. Okay. So the question was, uh, going back to the DART mission, there's some concern about maybe did we just cause some sort of chain reaction that will then impact Earth some point in the distant future? Uh, and so, ha so have. Have I encountered that? I have not really encountered that one yet. Uh, I don't know if anyone else here has. Um, I would I would say if it's immediately, it doesn't seem to be a concern. Like NASA is really careful about these sorts of things. Uh, and at the same time, what this is proving is that we can adjust the, the orbits of things if we needed to. So. Presumably, in the future, we would be much better at it. Even that, that if that were to happen, we'd be we'd probably have a way to fix it. That to try to allay people's fears. But Jean did. Yes. Yeah, Jean has an answer. It was chosen very carefully, so there's no chance that this is going to impact us. So even if we completely screwed up and it totally <laughs> backfired, that was not going to be our problem. It's nice to remind people that we are tracking 8,000 near-Earth objects, and only 150 of them are what we would call hazardous. They're big, and they could come within like 3% of an AU to the Earth. So if you just choose some random asteroid, it's not likely to hit the Earth in any case. Bubble isn't about mass, and it's clearly it's screwed up. But they want to see would they project straight, you know, 
butterfly effect in relation to confirm that there's something that needs to see that. So do I constantly see it? Mm -hmm. So, so the question was, has anyone seen any models that uh, try to track a butterfly effect on this? Um, I haven't seen anything like that. And I think to some extent, there's a lot of unknown variables. There's going to be things that we, we don't see right now that, that we can't really fully predict. So I think that's kind of the part of a butterfly effect also is that we, we can't quite predict that. So we've got to see what we do our best and then see what's coming along and then try to address that as we learn about it as quickly as possible. Thank you. So NASA chose an asteroid, a small asteroid orbiting a large asteroid. So what they did only affected the small asteroid. It's still bound to the larger asteroid, and the larger asteroid's orbit was not changed. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially, you only were affecting the small asteroid and not the orbit of the larger one. You'd have to change the orbit of the larger one in order to offer some uh, threat to Earth. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. It was really great. And uh, this is part of my question. So um, you said a lot throughout your presentation that this is like big news and it's talked about everywhere. I never see any of this yeah. stuff. This is amazing. I'm so happy this happened because I knew none of this. So I was hoping, do you have any resources maybe? Am I looking at the wrong news sites? Am I not actively engaging in the world? Is that part of the problem? <laughs> I don't think that's part of the problem. Okay. Um, no, I think, I think, so I'll clarify, like this was the, these were the news headlines that, um, that I saw. It's not necessarily news that you're going to see like plastered everywhere, especially this year. Um, just because I think we have a lot more going on in the world, it's, I think it's going to be a lot harder to miss some of this stuff, or a lot easier to miss, I'm sorry. Um, but where I usually start is a place like astronomy.com, because a lot of people, a lot of our audience members might look through there, that's where they might see some of these stories, and they might ask us these questions, and that's why I'll start there and be like, okay, this one seems interesting, this one seems interesting, and so on, then I read through all the abstracts. But it's not necessarily things that are plastered everywhere it's just that when there is a headline that someone might share on Facebook that's the headline that they're sharing but astronomy.com space.com is places I start but then then they and the reason why I go there honestly is because they always link the actual research papers so that I can find them really easily um, so that's another nice thing about that that particular place but yes Bob you're thinking about quasars I never heard the relation to star formation as part of a quasar, but a quasar is basically a supermassive black hole, as is a blazar, as is an mm -hmm. AGN. And do you know any, I, I just find it, it's hard to teach that. You're teaching mm -hmm. all these things, but they're black holes. So do you know, uh, her resource question prompted me, does, or does anyone know a resource that is effective in teaching all those together? Like about black holes and AGN? Yeah and lumping them all together so we can teach our audience instead of in introducing new topics and new mm -hmm. words all the time and just kind of condense it or whatever. I mean, I, I, I think I just condense it. Um, but I, I, think, I think a good point is, is the black hole. Like uh, most people have heard of black holes and they think that they are fascinating and they love black holes. And I always get asked about black holes with kids and I love black holes. Um, so we can talk about that and start at the point of a black hole, and then you can kind of build it up. A quasar is an AGN, so you can build up. Like, how do we know it's there? Well, it has this disk of material that, because it's going around the black hole so fast, it rubs together, and it warms up, and then we can see that, and we can see the effects. And then from there, sometimes when they're forming, they're forming in brand new galaxies and they're forming brand new stars and it has a lot of stuff and that stuff falls into the black hole to make the disk. And so you can kind of step out that way. Um, that's how I would approach that. Uh, but I, I don't know of a specific resource right now other than there's a lot of fun books on black holes and I'll have to think about that, but. Yeah, does anyone else have good resources on like AGN and black holes that they really like going to when talking to the public? Yep.
Any other ones? I'm sorry, I'm not looking. I'm checking on time. <laughs> yeah. So you brought up the elephant in the room with the Putin. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid in the 60s, um, the, the, there's uh, a mic if you could use that, please. Yeah, sorry. When I was a kid in the 60s, um, the one saving grace was we actually cooperated with the Russians to like make sure our hatches connected. And there was Mir and Soyuz. And um, so the scientists carried us through the Cold War. Um, what are we doing now as planetarians to counter the uh, Putin drama? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. If anyone has a really good answer on that, I think it's complicated. Um, I think it's complicated in a very different way in some ways, but I think that this is a really big political question more than anything else. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Well, one thing that's, that is happening is uh, many of us are keeping in touch with our Russian counterparts and um, trying to support them in, in whatever they are trying to do. Um, we are not trying to be political with them. We're just supporting the science. Um, once again, I was not aware on the space level of what mm -hmm. was going on. Um, but as an undergraduate student, I feel that now that I know that this is happening, I plan to do a little bit more research to become a little bit more um, educated on the subject so that when my friends start talking about it and joking around and um, talking about Ukraine, I can bring this up and say, hey, you know, there's other big stuff too. Like everything is really important, but this is something that I learned recently and I feel like it's something that we should talk about because I guarantee you no one my age is talking about the space part of this effect and I feel mm -hmm. it's very important that we as students should be aware and get involved somehow. So that's how I'm gonna try to get involved. Yeah. Um, on that earlier, uh, I remember that we were going to be having a IPS in Moscow uh, before, or St. Petersburg, I think. St. Petersburg. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I'm just curious, have we still been in touch with all the planners for that? I mean, are they are okay? I mean, do we, do we know what the situation was with them? I mean, um, I want to leave no planetarium behind, and so I'm just curious if we have been in contact with them. That, that's a micro question. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it later. Because I do think we are out of time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you again, Shannon. That was fantastic. Um, just a couple of quick announcements here as soon as I unlock my phone. Um, uh, first of all, we wanted to thank Cosm for running the Full Dome shows last night, so please show your appreciation. <clears throat> you know, s slicing shows, that's, uh, that's some work. They, then they got everything all prepared, and I guess um, they looked their best. We also wanted to thank um, the Milwaukee Public Museum and the Soref Planetarium, uh, Bob Bonadur's place, for sponsoring breakfast this morning. All right, now kind of like yesterday, we're, getting, we're our break food, we're trying to hide it from you. No, not, not really, just with the logistics. Um, the break food is upstairs on the second floor outside of the Encore break room. Um, but like with yesterday, it's there. Please take advantage of it. Um, we don't want to see stuff go to waste. And, you know, I know you're hungry already after breakfast, aren't you? Yeah, well, all right. It's not a GOPA if you don't uh, overeat. Okay, a um, couple of other miscellaneous things. Sean Latch had to cancel at the last minute.